What if everything you thought you knew about a case about justice was challenged decades later? That's what's happening right now with the Menendez brothers. Um, you know, a case that many thought was long settled. It's really it's a case that just won't quit. I mean, it's been what, like almost 35 years? Yeah. And it's still captivating the public. Exactly. And we're going to unpack all of that today, dive deep into why this case is back in the headlines and what it says about well, about us. OK, so for those who maybe weren't glued to their TVs in the early 90s or who, you know, weren't even born yet. Oh, yeah. There are definitely some people out there who weren't even alive then. Wild. Right. It's 1989. Beverly Hills. Lyle and Eric Menendez, these two brothers, they're young. I think Lyle was like, what, 21? Eric was 18. Yeah, something like that. Still just kids, really. Right, and they shoot and kill their parents, Jose and Kitty Menendez. Like, the case immediately becomes this huge media sensation. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it had everything. Right. Wealth, a seemingly picture-perfect family, this shocking crime. It was like something out of a movie. And those details, man, those details from the crime scene, they were brutal, and they, they really stuck with people. Six shots at their dad, ten at their mom. It was... It was a lot to process. And it was just, like, relentless. I mean, Eric even stopped to reload his shotgun during the attack. It was just intense. And then there was the trial itself. The brothers, they didn't testify right away. I mean, when they finally did, their demeanor, it was, I don't know, it was strange. Yeah, and the prosecution really seized on that. They painted them as these cold, calculating killers motivated by greed. I mean, they went on a spending spree right after the murders, bought new cars, Rolexes. It all seemed to fit this narrative that they were just entitled rich kids who wanted their inheritance. Right. But then the defense, they came back with this whole other side to the story, this claim that Lyle and Eric had been abused by their parents for years. And this is where things start to get really complicated. Right. Because you have to remember, this is the early 90s. The idea of men, especially young men from affluent families, being victims of abuse, especially sexual abuse, mm -hmm. it was almost unheard of. Or at least people weren't really talking about it openly. So it was easy to dismiss. Oh, yeah. It was a very different time. There was a lot of skepticism around those kinds of allegations. And it was really hard to get people to take them seriously. And this is also where the whole issue of inadmissible evidence comes into play, right? The judge basically wouldn't allow the jury to hear a lot of the testimony about the alleged abuse. Yeah, it was deemed irrelevant or unsubstantiated or whatever. So the jury never even got the full picture. It's just, it's wild to think how different things might have been if that evidence had been allowed, you know? Oh, absolutely. Could have changed everything. We might be having a very different conversation today. Which I guess is what makes this whole re-examination so fascinating. We're going to, we're going to get into all of that in a minute. But first, let's, um, and a big part of what's driving this new look at the case, this re-examination, is the Menendez family themselves. Um, they recently held this really powerful press conference where they, like, publicly came out in support of Lyle and Eric. It was, I don't know, it's pretty remarkable. It was. It's not every day you see a family come together like that, especially after so much time has passed, you know. Right. And it wasn't just like a quick statement or anything. I mean, they went, they really went there. Their statements, they were, they were emotional. They talked about the abuse. You could just feel the pain, the years of silence. It was just, it was heavy. It really highlighted the fact that there's a whole other side to this story, a side that maybe wasn't given enough weight back in the 90s. Yeah, and I think one of the most, like, the most impactful statements came from Kitty Menendez's own sister, Joan. You know, she was at the press conference. Oh, wow. Okay, so she's standing by the brothers. After all these years, that's significant. She is. She's saying she believes them, that they were abused. And I can't help but wonder, like, imagine if she had testified at the original trial, if she had stood up in that courtroom back then and said those things. Oh, man, that would have been that would have been huge. I mean, just the visual of it. Right. Yeah. Kitty's own sister looking at the jury, vouching for Lyle and Eric. That would have been hard to ignore. Totally. And you know what she said? She said she believes Lyle and Eric's actions were the desperate response of two boys trying to survive the unspeakable cruelty of their father. Like those words, they're just, they're chilling. And it really makes you question everything, you know? Right, because it's no longer just the word of the accused against, well, against no one, because the parents are gone. You have a family member corroborating their story, someone who knew them, who knew the family dynamics. It adds a whole new layer of complexity. And it wasn't just Joan. I mean, Jose Menendez's own niece, Ana Maria Baralt, she also spoke. And she said something that really stuck with me. She said, and I'm paraphrasing here, but she basically said that if this case were tried today, 
With all the information we have now about abuse, there's no doubt in her mind that Lyle and Eric would be sentenced differently. No doubt. Yeah. Wow. That's a powerful statement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it speaks to how much our understanding of these issues has evolved over the past few decades. Back then, it was like we were saying, it was a different time. There was so much silence around abuse, especially when it came to boys and men. So much stigma. Exactly. Yeah. And now, thankfully, we're starting to have more open conversations about it. Uh -huh. We're more willing to believe survivors, to understand the long-term impact of trauma. It's like what their aunt, Terry Baralt, said. She talked about the past 35 years, how she's carried this weight with her, this hope that she'll see her nephews again, that she'll get to hug them one day. It's just, it's heartbreaking. And it yeah. makes you think about all the lost time, all the potential healing that might have been possible if things had been different. It's a reminder that justice delayed can sometimes be its own form of injustice. Totally. And it brings us back to the DA to why he's taking another look at this case. He's basically saying, OK, let's look at this through the lens of what we know now about abuse, about trauma. And that's a huge shift because what might have been dismissed or ignored back then could be seen as really significant evidence today. Exactly. I mean, it raises so many questions like, would a jury today presented with these family accounts with expert testimony about abuse, would they have reached a different verdict? It's the million dollar question, isn't it? It is. And it's what makes this whole case, this re-examination so fascinating. We're not just talking about like relitigating the past here. We're talking about understanding how our evolving views on these really complex issues like abuse should factor into how we approach justice. And how we think about accountability and forgiveness and, and even just basic human compassion. Absolutely. Okay, so we've talked about the family statements, the DA's decision to re-examine the case, but we also have to talk about the legal complexities here. Because even with all this new information, it doesn't automatically mean Lyle and Eric are gonna walk free. We have to understand what resentencing actually means in this context. So we keep hearing this term resentencing, right? But what does that actually mean in this case? I mean, they were given life without parole. Yeah, it's a bit of a misnomer, honestly. It doesn't automatically mean they're getting out of prison or anything like that. Okay, so then what are we actually talking about here? So resentencing in this case means the judge could potentially change their sentences mm. um, to allow for the possibility of parole down the line. Got it. So not immediate release, but a chance at some point to go before a parole board and make their case. Exactly. But even if their sentences are changed, there's absolutely no guarantee that parole would be granted. The parole board would consider a whole bunch of factors, mm -hmm. you know, like their behavior in prison, the nature of the crimes, the potential risk they might pose if they were released. It's a really it's a long process. And it's a process that would involve like hearing from both sides. Right. Because. And we have to acknowledge this. There's another side to this story. I mean, Kitty Menendez's brother, Milton Anderson, he's been incredibly vocal, saying he's outraged that the DA is even revisiting this case. Which is completely understandable. Mm. You know, to have this wound reopened after all these years, to relive that trauma, it's got to be incredibly difficult for him and, and for anyone who was close to the victims. Right. And, and he's very clear about his stance. He believes that any focus on Lyle and Eric's experiences of abuse just it takes away from the horror of what they did. He feels very strongly that his sister and brother-in-law deserve justice and that to him, justice was served with the original verdict. And his perspective is one that a lot of people share, especially those who followed the case closely back then. They feel like, you know, focusing on the brother's past trauma minimizes the brutal act they committed. Hmm. It's complicated, right? There are strong emotions on all sides. There are. And to make this whole thing even more complex, we have to factor in the political climate. I mean, the DA, George Gascon, he's up for re-election. And this case, it's become a huge part of the conversation. Yeah, he's kind of caught in the middle of this perfect storm. You have some people praising him for taking another look at the case. They see it as a really bold move to, you know, right potential wrongs. And then you have others who are criticizing him, saying it's all politically motivated. He's just trying to appeal to a certain segment of voters. It, it's it's a tough spot to be in. It is. And regardless of where you stand on, on of Gascon or on the case itself, it's hard to deny that this whole thing forces us to ask some really tough questions, you know, about justice, accountability, how we deal with the complexities of abuse and its impact on on everyone involved. It's it's a lot to unpack. This case has always been about more than just the crime itself, right? It's about wealth, privilege, about family secrets, about violence. And now, all these years later, it's about how our understanding of things like abuse, like trauma, how that's evolved. 
and how that evolution should, maybe even must, inform our justice system. If it turns out Lyle and Eric were victims themselves, does that change how you view their actions? And if it does, what does that say about our ability to evolve, to adapt our understanding of justice, to fit new information and perspectives? We may never have all the answers, but these are the questions we have to keep asking. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive. It's a conversation that's far from over. 